In the last episode, we explored neural networks, the architecture of learning. So we saw how layers of artificial neurons stacked in their millions and billions can transform simple weighted inputs into astonishing abilities. But structure is only one side of the story. A brain-like network on its own doesn't do anything unless it has a way to learn. So that's where today's topic comes in, reinforcement learning. Now it sounds technical, maybe even a bit scary, but at its core, it's one of the simplest and most familiar ideas. It's how we humans and even animals learn most of the things that we do. So we try something, we see what happens, and then we just adjust. So success is rewarded and failure teaches us what not to repeat. And surprisingly, machines can be trained in a very similar way. Let's start with something human. So let's think about a child learning to ride a bike. The first attempt is usually wobbly, they fall. Maybe there's a scraped knee, and that is what we call negative feedback. Now, the next time they ride a bike, they balance a little longer. A parent cheers them on. They feel the thrill of moving forward without falling. That is what we'd call positive feedback. Now, slowly, through repeated trials, their brain builds an internal model. Leaning too far on either side leads to falling. Pedaling smoothly, on the other hand, keeps momentum, and eyes up will keep the balance. So the reward is not just avoiding pain, but also gaining the joy of independence. Now let's replace the child with an algorithm. So replace a scraped knee with a numerical penalty and parental cheers with a numerical reward. That's reinforcement learning in a nutshell. So a machine takes an action, it gets a reward or a penalty signal, and it updates its strategy accordingly. Over time, it learns which sequences of actions maximize rewards and minimize penalties. Technically, reinforcement learning revolves around three key components. So first, the agent, the decision maker, the learner. Secondly, the environment, so the world it interacts with. This could be a video game, a physical robot surroundings, or even the stock market. And third, the reward signal. So a number that tells the agent how good or bad its action was. Now, the agent's goal is actually quite simple, but complex to achieve, maximizing cumulative reward over time. Not just instant gratification, but long-term payoff. Here's a solid example. Imagine training an AI to play a video game like Pong. So at first, it doesn't know what to do. The paddle just moves randomly. It misses the ball most of the time, but every time it hits the ball, it gets a small reward and every time it misses, it gets a penalty. So through trial and error, after thousands of games, it figures out how to position itself better and better. Eventually, it becomes so good that, that it even beats human players. Not because it understands Pong, but because it's optimized its actions through reinforcement of good moves and punishment of bad ones. Now, let's zoom out for a second. Reinforcement learning doesn't just stick to games, it goes far beyond video games. So self-driving cars use it to navigate roads and they balance the reward of smooth driving with the penalty of unsafe maneuvers. Recommendation systems also use it to decide what video to show you next and it rewards themselves every time you click or watch longer. And robotics relies on it too. So robots folding laundry or navigating warehouses use reinforcement learning to adapt to unpredictable environments. And even financial trading systems experiment with it, placing trades, getting positive or negative returns, and adjusting strategies over time. So in short, reinforcement learning is about learning by doing, with feedback guiding the way. Now, let's shift into the economic lens, because reinforcement learning isn't just a technical method, it's also an economic philosophy in disguise. So at its heart, Economics, as we know, is all about decisions and incentives. People respond to rewards and penalties. Markets respond to profit and loss. And reinforcement learning formalizes this same principle for machines. When we design a reward function for an AI agent, we're essentially playing the role of the policymaker or the market designer. We decide what counts as good behavior and what counts as bad. And just like in economics, Poorly designed incentives can lead to disaster. So if you reward companies solely on short-term profits, they might cut corners on safety or exploit loopholes. 
if you reward an AI agent in a game for collecting points. It might even find strange hacks that technically rack up points, but break the spirit of the game. Now, in economics, we call this perverse incentives, and in AI, we call it reward hacking. The principle is the same. The agent optimizes for the metric, not for the meaning. Reinforcement learning also maps neatly onto a famous economic problem, exploration versus exploitation. Imagine you're running a cafe. You know your best-selling drink is cappuccino. You could exploit that knowledge by focusing all your effort on cappuccinos. But maybe if you experiment with matcha lattes or seasonal specials, you'll discover an even bigger hit. That's exploration. Now, in reinforcement learning, agents constantly face this trade-off. Should they exploit the strategy they already know, or do they explore something new that might be even better? So economists see this in investment decisions too, in research funding, and even in personal career choices. Do you stick with the safe job you know, or do you explore a new opportunity with uncertain payoff? The balance between exploration and exploitation is not just a machine learning problem, it's a human problem, a societal problem. So now let's talk about scale. Training state-of-the-art reinforcement learning models is enormously resource-intensive. Think of DeepMind's AlphaGo, the system that beat world champion in 2016. Training AlphaGo took millions of simulated games, played against itself, running on massive computing clusters. The economic cost was huge. Energy, hardware, time, talent. The cost barrier means only a handful of players, like Google, OpenAI, a few governments can afford to operate at that scale, even today. And here's the paradox. Just like in financial markets, where everyone can study the theory of investment, but only a few institutions can deploy billions in capital, reinforcement learning knowledge is democratized, but reinforcement learning power is centralized. That raises tough questions. Who controls the reward signals? Who decides what the agents are even optimizing for? and whose values are embedded in those decisions. Which brings us to the final lens, the values reflection. Because at a surface level, reinforcement learning is just maths, right? Maximizing reward, minimizing penalty. But let's look closer, and it's a mirror of human life. We too live by reinforcement, praise and punishment, success and failure. So incentives shape behavior, whether from teachers, parents, bosses, or peers. But here's the catch. The rewards we pursue don't always align with what makes us fulfilled. And behavioral economics gives us clear warnings here. So let's take the famous marshmallow test. Children were given a choice. Eat one marshmallow now, or wait and get two later. The kids who resisted the short-term reward often ended up with better life outcomes, not because of the sugar, but because of patience, foresight, and self-control. Humans who can optimize for long-term rewards often thrive. Machines in reinforcement learning, by contrast, need carefully designed reward functions to avoid always chasing the short-term high. Another example is hyperbolic discounting, where humans irrationally prefer smaller rewards today over larger rewards later. So we know saving for retirement is better than spending impulsively, but the immediate pleasure tempts us. Reinforcement learning agents face similar traps if their reward functions are not calibrated correctly. They might optimize for quick wins while missing the bigger picture. And this is where self-development lessons resonate. So let's take the book Atomic Habits, which reminds us that small, consistent actions compound into transformation. And reinforcement learning is exactly that. Each tiny adjustment of weights, each small feedback loop, adds up to dramatic change over time. But for humans, the real reward function is not just efficiency or productivity, it's meaning. It's whether those habits align with who we want to become. And here's where spirituality enters. Because if you look at it, across the world, across traditions, there's a consistent teaching. Not all rewards are equal. Some are shallow, some are deep. So chasing applause may bring a short-term rush but cultivating character brings long-term peace. Now, machines can't grasp that distinction, but as humans, we must. Reinforcement learning reminds us that what we choose to reward in our lives and in our societies shapes the outcome that we get. If we reward only consumption, we get consumerism. If we reward only speed, we get burnout. 
But if we reward wisdom, patience and compassion, we get a society that reflects those values. So what do we take away? Well, technically, reinforcement learning is how machines learn from trial and error through rewards and penalties. Economically, it raises profound questions about incentive design, concentration of resources, and the balance between exploration and exploitation. And spiritually, it's a mirror reminding us that rewards shape destiny and that the deepest rewards are often not the easiest ones. So we shouldn't just ask what the machine can do. I guess we should ask what we should do with it. Reinforcement learning, at its heart, is not just about algorithms. It's about us and what we choose to reward, whether it's in machines, in markets, and even in ourselves. But here's the bigger picture. Reinforcement learning belongs to just one tradition of AI, the sub-symbolic tradition, where systems learn patterns through feedback. But there's another tradition, slightly older, more rule-based and explicit, called symbolic AI. Now, these two schools, rules versus patterns, have defined decades of debate in the field. And increasingly, researchers are exploring hybrids that combine them. So that's exactly where we'll go next, episode six, which will be symbolic versus sub-symbolic AI. Two philosophies of intelligence, two very different ways of teaching machines to reason, and perhaps a clue to where AI's future might lie. See you then.